Well, hello, and thank you for coming uh, this morning uh, to uh, day two of 100 Years Later, the Frankfurt School and the Now. A um, couple of notes, as you can see on your program, um, uh, we're about to have our first panel of the day on critical theory from below, race, gender, and the Frankfurt School. At 1 p.m., uh, to note, uh, we'll be having our first learning session upstairs, sort of a mini seminar on Horkheimer's essay, uh, critical theory and regular, no, traditional <laughs> and critical theory. Um, and the, the point of me saying that is that uh, we will meet, kind of gather um, around 12.55 or so uh, towards the door and then, head our, and then head on up to the second floor. Um, yeah, and I'd like to say before handing it off to William, uh, just my gratitude to William, um, uh, the uh, initial moderator, Rebecca Ariel Port fell ill, and uh, William is uh, very nicely, very kindly taking up the slack. So I'll hand it over to him now. Thank you. All right. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to our panel on critical theory and race and gender. So I don't have a huge spiel about what this panel will be about because I will leave that to the speakers. But what I will do is introduce the speakers. They'll give about a 10 minute presentation. I will give my 10 minute presentation at the end, try to do a little discussion with them as you know what happened last night, and then we will do Q and A from the audience. All right, so to begin, who we have on the panel are you know, Professor Nathan Rochelle Duford. Nathan Rochelle Dufour is an assistant professor of government at Smith College. They work at the intersections of social and political philosophy, Frankfurt School Critical Theory, and Queer and Feminist Thought. Their first book, Solidarity and Conflict, A Democratic Theory, was recently published by Stanford University Press. In it, they argue against theories of solidarity that individualize and moralize it. In its place, they develop a democratic theory of solidarity through the conflicts those in solidarity agitate. They're currently working on a project about the sexual politics of the Frankfurt School. Next up, I, oh, we have me. Okay. Well, well uh, hi. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm just going to do a weird third person thing. Yeah. So William Paris is an assistant professor in philosophy at the University of Toronto. Impressive. <laughs> he is also an associate editor for the journal Critical Philosophy of Race. His research focuses on the history of African American philosophy, 20th century continental philosophy, and political philosophy. He has published on Franz Fanon and Gender, Sylvia Winter's Phenomenology of Imagination, and C.L.R. James and Hannah Arendt. He is also at work on his book manuscript, Racial Justice and Forms of Life Toward a Critical Theory of Utopia, under contract with Oxford University Press, that aims to provide a novel theory of racial justice that goes beyond the political freedom of the state towards a broader social freedom of time. Next up, we have Professor Eduardo Mendieta. Eduardo Mendieta is a professor of philosophy, affiliated faculty at the School of International Affairs and the Bioethics Program at Penn State University. In the spring of 2020, he was a visiting fellow at the, oh no, I have to say this German word, Forschungskolleg Human Wissenschaften. I'm sorry about that. I know, I crushed it. In Bad Homburg, Germany. He is the author of The Adventures of Transcendental Philosophy and Global Fragments, Globalizations, Latin Americanisms, and Critical Theory. He is also co editor with Jonathan Van Antwerpen of The Power of Religion in the Public Sphere, and with Craig Calhoun and Jonathan Van Antwerpen of Habermas and Religion and with Amy Allen from Alienation to Forms of Life, the Critical Theory of Rahel Yegi, the Cambridge ha ha Habermas Lexicon, and Justification and Emancipation, the Critical Theory of Rainer Forst. He's a 2017 recipient of the Franz Fanon Outstanding Achievements Award. And lastly, we have Professor Paul North. Paul North writes and teaches on literature and other media, continental philosophy, literary and critical theory. His last book, The Yield, Kafka's A Theological Re Reformation, came out in 2015. A new book, The Logic of Likeness on hom Homeotics, will appear in 2020. He runs an interdisciplinary workshop on critical theory and is researcher, a researcher on the Mellon Foundation grant, Critical Theory in the Global South. 
Currently, he is co-editing with Paul Ryder of OSU, an updated edition of Marxist Capital in a new translation. Oh, I saw you on the Zoom. Now I, I recognize you. Okay. <laughs> and that's why you didn't recognize me. Um, all right. So let's um, get going. And we are going to basically go in the order uh, that we are sitting. And we'll start with Nathan. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, so I've been working on this, it, it, just like for background, I've been working on this project on sex, gender, and sexuality in the Frankfurt School sort of a little bit for a very long time. And there are basically two ways that interpreters think about this in the work of the early Frankfurt School. So the first way is to interpret what they do have to say about um, sex, gender, I'll use the term sex gender because in German it's the same word and at the time that they were writing the English word gender didn't exist yet. Um, and sexuality, people will interpret those things as either misogynist or homophobic. Um, there are lots of like particular passages that people will pull out, um, notably for the homophobia one the aphorism where he says that homosexuality and totality belong together, um, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and then for his treatment of women in Dialectic of Enlightenment, right? The second excursus is about Juliet. This is something that most people don't like make a big deal out of, but that's a choice, right? He chose a woman figure and he talks a lot about the fact that she is a woman being made under a patriarchal society. Um, but the depiction that he provides is not a nice one, right? It isn't a nice thing to be a woman in a patriarchal society. And that gets depicted as his endorsement of what patriarchy does to women, right? Um, so that's one set of kind of criticisms of what they're up to. They are all misogynists and homophobes and well, you know, yikes. Um, on the other hand, there's another set of interpreters who just say, well, they didn't really have much to say about this at all. And so there's no elaborated theory of sex and gender. There's no like real reason to think that they were very concerned with this at all. And that seems to be one of the more predominant ways that people deal with this in early Frankfurt School thought. Um, I don't want to do either of those. I want to do something a little bit different. And I want to start with psychoanalysis, right? So the members of the early Frankfurt School, like Horkheimer, Adorno, um, from like these people are like invested in psychoanalysis. And it's deeply strange to me to think that a group of people who took as their project to um, take the insights of Freud and blend them with the materialism of Marx had nothing to say about sex and gender, right? Sex is the interpretive framework in psychoanalysis, right? So it takes the sex body and mind and puts it right at the center of subjectivity. Psychoanalysis doesn't get off the ground without it. And so now you're looking at all these people and you're like, yeah, they're all interested in Freud, but they had nothing to say about sex. That doesn't track for me. And so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some ways that they do understand sex, gender, and sexuality. Um, I don't know if I'll get to any sexuality stuff. If you have questions about it, I'm happy to talk about it. There's um, a lot of really interesting work about it. Um, so I'm just gonna start with Horkheimer. And uh, AJ last night was talking about his um, racket theory. And that's where I'm gonna start too. So Horkheimer develops this theory of society as a kind of like constructed racketeering mechanism, right? He calls it the originary uh, source of domination, right? This is how we end up hierarchically structured 
is through something akin to a social relation structured by a racket. So what he has to say about this is that this actually comes from patriarchy. Like he talks about the patriarch as the Leviathan, right? The patriarch is the person who institutes civil society. That's where it comes from. So it's a kind of Weberian view of um, patriarchy, except that Horkheimer doesn't think it's natural, right? Weber actually thinks, well, like, yeah, of course our pol political system comes from patriarchy. That's just how human beings are. Women are weak and men are strong. Horkheimer turns that around and says, no, um, women are made weak, right? Think about the structure of how, like, um, a racket works, right? So you can think about a mob boss who comes over to your store and is like, hey, like, you've got really nice windows and it would be really bad if someone broke them, right? I'm sure that you don't want your windows broken. And if you pay me, I'll protect your windows. The mob boss is the protection and the threat. That's what the patriarch is. The patriarch is the threat that protects the woman from himself, which as in the mob boss case, it, it's not actually protective, right? So Horkheimer thinks that this relationship creates women as fearful and weak because there is a structured conspiracy against them. And, you know, it's gonna get worse about, like he's not gonna keep uh, any kind of interesting radicalism about women. We're, we're gonna drop it. But <laughs> there is some interesting radicalism in it. And this comes from his authority in the family. So he develops this theory of authority as coming from the family. And authoritarianism is actually a reaction against the lack of authority that's generated in the family. So we get authoritarianism out of basically a daddyless society. No one's got one and we're all looking for one. And boy, uh, you know, Donald Trump is like the big daddy of them all. So let's get him. He'll protect me and he'll hurt the people who want to hurt me, right? And so as an aside, this also gets to, I think, why this matters now um, is because we're doing a lot of thinking about our contemporary sort of like democratic decline and the rise of authoritarian structures. And um, people are using the Frankfurt School to do that, but they aren't using the sort of theoretical mechanism in the background of patriarchy that they actually did to understand it. So, the patriarchy for Horkheimer introduces both the power motive and the profit motive into the structure of society. Um, so this is a quote from Authority and the Family. The patriarchal system introduced mankind to class conflict and to the rupture between public and familial life. While within the family, the principle of naked authority came to be applied to the extent that any principle besides that of subordination prevails in the modern family. The women's maternal and sisterly love is keeping alive a social principle dating from before historical antiquity, right? So we get women as these kind of like special natural creatures who protect us from the problems introduced by patriarchy, right? This is a deeply patriarchal way of understanding women, um, but it also makes sense of how the power motive gets generated in our society. He also says, right, the profit motive is there. So later in the text, he says that um, monopolies require sort of a constant coordinated and covert action to uh, maintain, quote, the conditions of division, the conditions of a division of labor which favors them, as well as sediment, quote, the despair of women and children, the deprivation of any happiness in life, the material and psychic exploitation via the economically based hegemony of the father. So really we get in authority in the family, 
we get a critique of authoritarianism, we get a critique of capitalism, and we get that through a kind of quasi theory of patriarchy. And so in order to sort of get this off the ground, any of their thinking about um, socio-political structures or uh, sort of like economic systems, we have to include a kind of critique of patriarchy. And it actually makes a lot of sense when you think about them as Freudians, right? So when we take Marx, we get uh, critiques of material structures. And when we take Freud, we get critiques of patriarchal ones. So Freud is kind of this like weird figure where he is both an agent of the patriarchy, but he's also a great critic of it. He, he sees so clearly how it works and sometimes he's like, and I'm going to do that because it's good, which yikes, right? Like and that shouldn't be what's happening. Um, but when we take both of those things together, the this unit of social organization that we get out of that is the family. And this is sort of the nexus of where a Marxist critique and a Freudian critique sit next to each other very easily. Okay. How long have I been talking? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> okay. um, uh, let's say you've been talking for eight minutes. Okay, can I have five minutes? Sure. We're, we're, we're negotiating. <laughs> I, you are now. Yes, you're here. Yeah. Um, okay, so right in Horkheimer's work specifically, we get this very interesting critique of the family that goes via a Marxist analysis and kind of Freudian analysis. Adorno's work on gender is much more sort of sketched around. He doesn't have a text like Authority in the Family where you could pull a lot of specific material from, but he does, um, he has an essay that was just recently titled uh, or translated called On the Problem of the Family. Uh, it was translated by Jacob Blumenfeld, if you're interested. The translation is very good. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that today, but if you're interested in this problem, it's definitely something that you should look at. It's very short. Um, so what I wanna talk about is the way that Adorno talks about gendered subjects as specifically gendered and the way that the engendering of our subjectivity is harmful to us. This is a structure that damages us when we try to comport ourselves within it, right? It's very easy to see how this happens to women, this sort of attempt to um, work your way out of the double binds that tie up cultural ideas of womanhood and expectations and permissions for women. Um, but he also talks about this with manhood, right? In this aphorism where he says the thing about homosexuality that makes everyone insane. Um, so here's what he says. I'm gonna read kind of a long quote. I wish I could put it up for you. A certain gesture of manliness, be it one's own, be it that of another, deserves mistrust. It expresses independence, surety of the power of command, the silent conspiracy of all men with each other. I, and like, you pull the racket back through that, right? That's a silent conspiracy of men with each other. And if you don't think, well, well, there's no silent conspiracy of men, right? In the 80s, it was very popular to call feminists conspiracy theorists. And now you see that again happening to people who are engaging in all kinds of critical thought, like critical race theory, feminist thought, queer thought. But you can think about the ways that men protect other men from harm that could befall them when they harm women, right? This is not an accident. Um, police do this for other police. People in families, men in families will do it for other men in their family. And women will respond in similarly conspiratorial ways. So um, my favorite example of this is at some bars, 
if you go into the women's bathroom, there will be signs in all the stalls that instruct you to order a specific drink if you need help from the bartender because you're scared of your date. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Right. Um, and, and the reason you didn't know that is because women are conspiring against you because they feel conspired against, right? There's this kind of rational reaction to living under a conspiracy of men where it's like, okay, well, what else are we going to do but develop secret networks to protect ourselves now? Okay, so that's my aside about the conspiracy of all men. I want to get to that actually, the, the other gender part. Um, the joys of such men were on the contrary of their models, which hardly anyone alive really matches, for human beings are always better than their culture, have altogether something of the latent act of violence. By all appearances, this is threatened to others, though he has long since had no need to do so sprawled on an easy chair. In truth, it is past violence against himself. If all pleasure sublates earlier displeasure, then here displeasure is raised, unmediated, untransformed, stereotypically, into pleasure. Unlike wine, every glass of whiskey, every puff on the cigar, still recalls the reluctance which it must have cost the organism to accustom itself to such powerful stimuli, right? We see a lot of this, like, masculinity as a kind of self-harm today in our society. It's very easy to find men's organizations to help men who feel kind of lost and unsure of what they're up to, to go and learn how to be men. And a lot of this involves just like injuring yourself, like straightforwardly, it is damaging to your physical body, right? And so like, I think that from this, one of the things that we can see is that the theory of genders that Adorno is trying to develop in this kind of sporadic way in different places is actually deeply relevant for how we gender today. And it's worth going back and thinking through how they connected that specifically to fascism. Because it's not, in my opinion, a coincidence that, oh, well, we're getting all this authoritarian stuff that they talked about. And, oh, weird, we're also getting all this gender stuff that's pretty much exactly the same, right? Um, and so that's, that's what I have for you. I, I thought it's not a wrap up, but. The, <laughs> Um, next up, we have Professor Eduardo Mendieta. Thank you for being here on a beautiful Saturday morning. Um, so, thank you. And thank you for the organizers of this great event. I'm delighted to be part of it. Uh, perhaps I should begin a little bit with an autobiographical remark, like Sheila did last night. Um, and that is that I actually was a student of Habermas and we actually collaborated on several things. Um, I had originally come to Frankfurt to study with his old friend, uh, one of his colleagues from graduate school, that's called Carl Otto Appel, who had moved or had been hired at Frankfurt, I think to take Hockheimer's chair uh, when he passed away, um, and Appel was extremely important in the evolution of Habermas's thought. Um, but I want to do some preliminary remarks, which I hope are useful. First, that the, uh, the Frankfurt School began as, a, as the Institute for Social Research. That's what was endowed. And that endowment is what allowed the Frankfurt School to survive over 100 years. And eventually, the term Frankfurt School is metonymic of the place where allegedly this thinking theorizing took place. Um, and then there's another metonymic, which is critical theory. Uh, but we have French critical theory, 
we have all, all kinds of different critical theories. And I think it's important to disaggregate these things. Um, second, because you have an institute and you had someone like Hochheimer and Pollock who were very savvy, they were able to rescue their endowment and transfer it from Germany, otherwise the Nazis would have expropriated it and take their library. They went to London, then New York, and then eventually to LA. Meanwhile, the monies from the endowment allow them to support several of their colleagues, including Walter Benjamin, who I don't think is strictly a critical theory philosopher. So for instance, go check the correspondence between Adorno and, and Benjamin, and it's savage. It's savage. Um, second, it's important that we recognize that when the Frankfurt School um, Institute for Social Research was established, it was meant to be an institution for the study of the working class, and it had very close relationships with the Marx Engel Institute in Moscow, in Amsterdam, which is what allowed the writers of the Institute to have previews on the manuscripts that weren't being discovered of Marx, in particular the 1844 manuscripts. Um, and eventually, the Second International and Moscow decided that these people are too heterodox. They're too out there. They're not really Marxist. And so they began to dissociate. And of course, when they migrated to England and then eventually to the United States, they took distance from Marxism. There were, there were several people that had close associations, associations with the Communist Party, with Fogel, who wrote a very important work called Oriental Despotism. He was sidelined, eventually there was a split between them. Eric Fromm, who used to be a member, he also was let go. Um, so there were all kinds of really interesting, let's say anti-communist relationships. And, and that's important to keep in mind. And then when they come back, to Germany, they want to keep their distance from communism and so on and so forth, because um, having been in the United States, they don't want to be called up uh, to those infamous trials. So that's important. It begins as a historical materialist project, and yet it, it departs. Um, I think a third or whatever, um, I have letters here, so I don't know, E. <laughs> it's also important that we recognize that there have been generations of the Franco School, of the Institute for Social Research. So we talked about the first generation, the second generation, the third, and even a fourth. Um, the first generation were all Jews. The second generation were none of them Jews, except eventually you get uh, others who join and, and so on. But uh, Apple, Avermas, Velmer, they're not Jews. And that is very interesting. That is very, very profound. So that's the first generation. The second generation um, is obviously, I just mentioned them, Habermas, Appel, uh, Belmer, it might be, oh, Oscar Necht, uh, a social democrat. And then the third generation is the much younger scholars who were students in Frankfurt under Appel, Habermas and Belmer. Now, each one of these generations, I want to suggest to you, 
had a different emphasis. Uh, the first generation engages in a critique of instrumental reason. One of the key texts of Hochheimer is called The Eclipse of Reason. And it is an eclipse of reason because instrumental rationality takes over. The second generation is really interested in the linguistification of rationality. This is Habermas's project, which is in turn a critique of the first generation. So some of the most uh, intense criticisms of the first generation are actually from Habermas, uh, which is very interesting. And then the third generation, which includes Sheila, Nancy Fraser, I would argue to Sheila Cornell, um, I should have repeat names, um, shifts away from a critique of rationality and a reconstruction of reason based on the linguistification of reason. Um, and they begin to focus on uh, social philosophy, political theory, and of course, democratic theory. Now, let me point out that the third generation is mostly made of women, not all of them, but women who are not German. They are, let's say, adoptees. Um, finally, notwithstanding my colleagues' defense <laughs> of the Bronco School's alleged contribution to questions of gender, uh, sexuality, and gender justice, was and remains a profoundly patriarchal institution. There's only one German woman who claims herself to be in the tradition, and that's Rahel Yegi. And I met her when she was a graduate student. Uh, Regina Friday, Regina Friday might be another one. She was also in, in my cohort. But they're all males. And they continue to perpetuate their patriarchy, their theoretical patriarchy. Um, I don't think the, the first generation and the second generation really took seriously the question of the relationship between sex, gender, and racial uh, and sexual justice. It was only when you had people like Sheila and Nancy Fraser, Drusilla Cornell, who this really begins to be developed within the school and critical theory tradition. Um, so those are just preliminaries. I'll be quick. So who's looking at the bottom? How privileged is that? So I, I'm being very critical, and so the question that you might be asking: Well, do you have anything positive to say? Well, why have you? devoted your life to thinking about it. <laughs> um, well, first of all, the early Franco school were pioneers in the study of what they would call uh, critical uh, criminology, critical penality, or generally carceral studies. And this goes back, go back to Georg Busch, and Otto P. Sharma, who wrote in the 30s, late 30s, before they actually, no, they actually had already left. Uh, I think a book that remains extremely important, which is Punishment and Social Structure. And it is a fantastic, still relevant analysis of the evolution of capitalism and how it relates to systems of punishment. And this work influenced Angela Davis. As you know, Angela Davis went to Frankfurt because Marcus said there. By the way, uh, my colleague last night said, oh, Angela Davis has a joke. That was not a joke. That was an anecdote 
from Angela Davis about the time she went to Adorno and said, I think I must return. And the point that Angela Davis was making there is that Adorno had no interest in activism, had no interest in political work. Um, and, and so she felt quite dejected, which is why she ended up taking most of her work with Oscar Neck, someone who we forget is part of the second generation. Uh, nonetheless, I think this work on prisons, penality, criminology, uh, remains extremely relevant for us today where we have mass incar incarceration. Um, and so our system of mass incarceration is correlated with the rise of neoliberalism. Um, obviously the recrudescence of uh, white supremacy and some notion about the failings of black communities. Um, I mean, I taking many notes on why is it that we essentially warehouse African Americans for decades, for life? How, what is the political economy of that? And I think we have resources there. The second thing that we could take as a major contribution is the discussion in Adorno and Habermas on working on the past. And Adorno has a wonderful essay on this. And then Habermas's take of that concept in coming to terms with the past, which became the ground background for the historian's debate. And I think this is extremely relevant because right now we're having um, a class war, a cultural war about the meaning of slavery. As you know, there's this war on critical race theory and it has to do with this notion that this long history, not only of slavery, Jim Crow, uh, hangings, lynchings, and then segregation and mass incarceration are without meaning. And I think these concepts of working through the past, coming to terms with the past, remain very relevant. And here, the text that I have in mind is something that Tom McCarthy, uh, probably second generation critical theories, uh, wrote a, a wonderful book, uh, book called Empire and the Idea of Human De Development. And he has an essay there where he tries to say, how can we apply this concept of working on the past and coming to terms with the past to make sense of the histories of American races. Um, finally, it has been mentioned that the concept of the authoritarian personality is extremely important. Um, there's a book by Lowenthal called Masters of Deception, and it was just reissued, uh, which is uh, related to the authoritarian personalities or the studies on the authoritarian personality, which are about how the a figure like Trump can then become the front person for all kinds of reactionary movements. So it's the uh, agitator. And, and this is really important. We need to take those resources and, and deploy them. Did I go over? <laughs> and next up, we have Professor Paul North. Thank you.
Thank you both. I was taking lots of notes. I appreciate that. I'm going to talk about the non-Frankfurt School, Walter Benjamin, um, who, although he hovered around it, he got some nice financial support from it. He was excoriated by Adorno on and off privately and publicly for years. You know, when he wrote a version of these theses on the philosophy of history, as they're called, um, he ran over in Paris when he was in exile to the home of a, um, a Jew, to put it that way, Soma Morgenstern, who had come to first Vienna, then Frankfurt, from the Pale of Settlement and to all these cosmopolitan German assimilated Jews. This was like the real Jew. Everyone thought, finally, we see what a Jew is. The Germans thought it was their internal Jews. The Jews thought it was the people from the Pale. And Soma just wanted to get to Frankfurt, in any case. He read this, these theses to Soma Morgenstern, and Morgenstern recalls in his um, diaries, Benjamin ran over just after the Hitler-Stalin pact was announced. He had finally formulated these. He had been doing it for a while. And he ran to Morgenstern's house. Morgenstern also remembers the first time he met Benjamin. They had been trying to have lunch, and Benjamin said, well, I have to find a time where Teddy is not bothering me. So they went to lunch, and halfway through lunch, when Benjamin was telling Soma Morgenstern a dream he had, Adorno came in and insisted on interpreting the dream. <laughs> Benjamin, Benjamin, as they were walking out, whispered to Morgenstern, siehst du erfolgt mir auch in den Träumen hinein? Do you see, he also follows me into my dreams. <laughs> <clears throat> Just putting a word forward for Benjamin. I think there are a number of resources in Benjamin for thinking race, racialized um, thinking, peoples, and resistance. Also, I think there are resources for thinking about gender, sex, gender, and um, violence around it. Uh, they have to be taken a little bit out of context. Uh, he was one of these early Jews, and he was thinking of Jews, but he had a sense of something that he called later the oppressed, which is interesting. And I started to teach and read the theses together with Toni Morrison and with the Kambahi River Collective Statement in prisons, and they make a kind of powerful triumvirate, to use that word. Some of the things you can pull out of Benjamin are his idea of a non-thick mass. This is a peculiar idea he developed as a young person, or a consistently inconsistent plurality, or a diaspora of very different um, types or of many differences that is kind of pushed together. He thought of the city mass as not having a, a single identity, but able to live together. Another resource for thinking of um, race and gender would be his very important text toward a critique of violence, which would need to be extended, but you could understand insofar as what he's arguing there is that the law produces the violence of society, that gender violence, gendered violence, racial violence, violence against um, racialized people have a connection there to the law and the state. And Benjamin is not the only person to make that argument. Obviously, lots of people in black thought and gender theory have done that too. But that's a very powerful text. Um, another is a little bit of, a, of an alleyway too. Uh, he raised a question coming out of his Kantian background. How is it possible for anyone to experience someone else's experience? This seems like a fundamental question that could be asked in these contexts. And the text to look into for that is called The Storyteller, in which he starts to talk about how actually culture is constituted by others' experience and a sharing of experience, an experience that outlives the barriers to it. But actually today, briefly, like everyone else has been brief, that meaning of brief, which means <laughs> I better get to the end, um, I'm going to do a commentary on one line from the, the so-called theses on the philosophy of history. This is actually a phrase. The tradition of the oppressed teaches us. Die Tradition der Unterdrückten belehrt uns. Since we're in the Goethe Institute, I'll speak some German. The tradition of the oppressed teaches us. 
It's a peculiar phrase, first of all, because the oppressed don't have a tradition, according to exactly what he's laying out here. The tradition belongs to the victors. The tradition is a kind of continuum of goods that gets handed down, whoever the victors may be, which eventually became, in certain contexts, the Jews. In this case, they weren't in Germany. At certain points in history, they were, right? You could think of the Hebrew Bible as an attempt to hand down goods by the victors and everyone else, the peoples, lose out. But he says there's a tradition of the oppressed. Die Tradition der Unterdrückten. Several of these words are important to us. Tradition, what would a tradition be if it was not a tradition of the victors? He says it doesn't look like a tradition. You have to look in the shadows of history. And a lot of people have been doing that in race and gender studies now in very powerful ways. Um, the oppressed is an interesting category. He is saying, like the Kambahi River Collective was saying, that there, there is a solidarity, even more a kind of unity among oppressed peoples that has to be constructed in a certain way. Benjamin is thinking of Marx and the proletariat as a historical oppressed whose unity will lead to a break in history. But you can think of it in other ways. And the Kambahi statement thinks about black queer women as being the unifying factor, factor X there that unifies. And then he uses the word belehren or teaches us. So tradition, unterdrücken, and belehren. Tradition, the oppressed, and teaching. It's a particular kind of teaching like the moral of a story or something you might do in a free teaching institution like the Brooklyn Institute, which is a great, a great thing in this world. Um, so there, there should be a kind of wisdom that should be taken out of the tradition of the oppressed that we can teach. Um, but there's a problematic side to this idea as well. And that is a history that needs to be studied, and I have not done the study of this history, the history of this idea that the oppressed will be victorious, that the oppressed contain the revolutionary knowledge or power or spark, even though it looks like they're oppressed, they're truly, in truth, the unoppressed. They're the only ones who are free. You can imagine how this is problematic. It's like to say the slave being the most captive, being the most restrained, is actually the most free. Or you can read something off the slave's experience that is absolutely necessary for producing freedom, which has to be universal. So I just looked a little, well, that's problematic, I think. I looked a little into the idea the tradition of the oppressed teaches us. And um, the places to look for it are in Marx, first of all, who turns this into a principle of history. His first take on it is in the introduction to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right from 1843. Where then, he says, is the possi positive possibility of German emancipation? Answer, in the formation of a class with radical chains. A class of civil society, which is not a class of civil society, and a state which is the dissolution of all estates, a sphere which has a universal character by its universal suffering. This, it's been recognized before, ties to an old Abrahamic topos, which really needs to be studied, which comes up in the Kambahi River Collective Statement as well. They say, we might use our position at the bottom, however, to make a clear leap into revolutionary action. If black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free, since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all the systems of oppression. Now, you can see the logic to that, because the most, if the most oppressed are free, the, the idea at least is that all other oppressions are wiped out, that there's a kind of accumulation of oppression the other side of that is that there's a, a kind of in what they call an inherent value to black queer women that is there actually much more than the rest of society that can be, um, if it's recognized, this is a certain way of politicizing people. I'm not arguing against it, but you see it has two sides. One is to say, and it's to say that the worst is the best. And Benny means arguing precisely against making new historical victors. This has a couple of origins in the Bibles. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And the book of Job gives us a perfect picture of this. God, it turns out there you get the other side of it. 
which is really kind of dastardly. Satan comes to God and says, how do you know these people are faithful to you? How do you know they believe their stuff comes from you? The only way you know that the stuff is good that you have, that you're really valuable, is if it's all taken away. This seems like a problematic side to it. I would argue that Benjamin takes this motif, that's my time. Now you're really imposing the, the time of, he pretended like he didn't want to, but I only have a couple of words. So the drawbacks of this tradition are that it fetishizes suffering, that it imagines the unity of all the oppressed, which might be a good thing to imagine, through the most oppressed. So you have to find a most oppressed. Might even imagine, as some folks think, a kind of race to the most oppressed. It conceives of the solidarity on the basis of a minimal shared humanness rather than on difference, for example and conceives of a human being as a vessel for value. And as soon as you have this moralistic view in which a human being is a vessel of value, you have to have people who do not have value. You can't imagine someone full of value without a comparant, an animal, a different sort of person. It is a pernicious uh, legacy of moralism that value can be calculated. So it's my hypothesis that you can find a non-calculating, non-value calculating theory of the oppressed in Benjamin's thesis. But that would take a long teaching, which I hear from our leader we're not going to do today. That's it. Thank you. Um, okay, so here's what I, I would like to do, and you know, parts of um, my conversation relationship between critical theory and race are going to be slightly polemical, I think, slightly controversial. Why? Because I think even though we live in a time where it seems as if you know, everyone is talking about race, everyone is knowledgeable about race, it's no longer the repressed structure of society, I actually think that you know, much of the discussion around race, how to understand it, what you know, one must do um, you know, practically and theoretically is rather poor. Partially, I think the, the issue is um, a lot of left theorists, you know, here's my polemical moment, um, they're a bit too internet pilled. And so their theorization of race is often constructed because they've run into someone on the internet who makes it seem as if race is this mystical thing. It has a life of its own. And to be a hard nosed materialist, you gotta constantly kill that person in your head. To the point where, you know, it seems as if a lot of left critical theory has taken it as all you need to do is to say, I've read Adolf Reed and there's enough said about race. I think the, you know, what is inadequate is this idea that the only way to talk about race or racism is simply the, in the accusatory tone of why do white people have racist ideas in their head? And usually the response by those on the left is like, how are you going to build, you know, a multiracial mass movement if you're making real white people feel bad about themselves? Whether that is a good strategy for developing politics or not, that does not acquit us of the necessity of developing a critical theory that tries to look at, well, how has race sedimented the present? So partially my polemics is, I think, uh, um, some people will have run together too quickly theory and praxis, and thus they think whatever critical theory they write has to also be something that they imagine will be popular for whoever they imagine the normal person living in Peora, Illinois will like. I don't think that that is adequate because I think I am starting this idea of race as a non-contemporaneous intrusion on the present. What do I mean by this? I'll explain it a bit, but you know, for those of you who know, you know, I'm getting this from Ernst Bloch, but um, you know, from, to begin, we should understand race as you know, one group you know, dominating another group and thus preventing them from sharing in some normative future. What I mean by this is, take the example of slavery. When you enslave people, 
You are not just, you know, obviously um, attempting to discipline and control what their body is doing. You're also imputing what their future will be like. Their future will not be one in which they will own a home, in which they will be able to raise their children without fear of them being snatched. Their future is not one in which we all share in equal rights, et cetera. And quite literally, and I'm being literal here, when I'm, I want to talk about race as sort of this sort of temporal segmentation, you are stealing time from them. What are the consequences of that theft of time? Now, again, to be polemical, the, the left critical theorists will say, what, you think you know, slavery literally lives on in the present, that slavery explains everything? No, no, no. What I'm saying is, by you know, creating this you know, um, non-simultaneity, by separating you know, um, the possible norm of the future we can share, that can certainly accumulate in the present insofar as you know, we are no longer starting in the same place when we're trying to envision a shared future. I hope I'm making sense so far. You don't need a mystical account of, race, uh, of slavery living on to say that, you know, that, you know, those, um, that violent diversion, that violent disruption of time can have consequences further down the road. And in fact, Ernst Bloch, in you know, a really great series of essays called Heritage of Our Times, which is his attempt to try to understand how was it possible for fascism to happen? How was it possible for this to take root in these social practices? I'll read a relatively long quote and then say what I'm getting from it. Not all people exist in the same now. They do so only externally by virtue of the fact they may all be seen today. But that does not mean that they are living at the same time with others. Rather, they carry earlier things with them, things which are intricately involved. One has one's times according to where one stands corporeally, above all in terms of classes." End quote. So he starts to look at Germany. He's realizing the time of, say, you know, German peasants, you know, the bourgeoisie, those who live in the city, those who live in the countryside, they have different habits different expectations, and they're living in a time where, especially he's thinking about you know, the peasants, where the life or the future that they envisioned is being dismantled, gobbled up, and eroded, leaving them without a sense of, so where do I stand in this world? Bloch contends that this fracturing of time, this breaking of time, if you don't offer a new vision of a normative future that all can share, made them vulnerable to a um, uh, wistful nostalgia, maybe we could return to how things were. Maybe, you know, your future is being stolen by other people. But, you know, what he's trying to say is objectively time is being fragmented insofar as the habits, the expectations, the ideas of how our life could go is being either diverted, limited, or distorted. And so I want to focus on the social practices of racialization rather than only on the objective thoughts of racism. It is common, especially in the United States, to think of racialization through things like you know, um, mass incarceration, but increasingly we're thinking about housing, um, you know, accumulation of wealth. We should be thinking about this, not in terms of whether there are naughty white people who are saying the N-word in their heads or something like that, but we should be thinking about what are the social practices that allow people to have a livable future given the world that we live in? It turns out you need wealth. It turns out you need a, a specific amount of time in order to accumulate the amount of wealth you need to buy a house. And then when we look at the 2008 crisis, you know, it turns out some black people did what they were supposed to do. They bought the house, they got the mortgage. And what happened? Those were shitty mortgages. And they lost those houses. They lost those futures. And if you want to see like, some of even like the crudest racism in there, so apparently some of those loans were like, called mud people loans. They would go into these places, take advantage of people's desperation, tie them up, and then steal those houses again. Partly what, what I'm trying to say here is, what effects does this you know, um, experience of a stolen future have on people's practices, their habits, their sense of self, and their sense of how to be in solidarity? So we could understand time as a uniform, uniform march of seconds and hours, but I think that that is incorrect. We should understand time as the practices, expectations, and habits 
of a for you know towards a particular type of future that is either supported or limited by the concrete past that we have inherited. Fanon, who I think should be a part of the critical theory tradition, and again, I'm gonna be polemical. I think a lot of people misunderstand what's going on in black skin, white masks. Um, even, you know, um, yeah, I wanna to be too hard with him, but um, I believe uh, it might've been um, either Stuart Hall or somebody looked at black skin, white masks and thought, you know, this is simply like a bourgeois book about how, you know, Fanon really wants to be accepted by white people. That is not what's going on there. I think, you know, it's not fair reading, but, you know, we do polemics sometimes. Fanon understands race as a pathology of time. And he means this in two ways that I think critical theory should analyze. First, racialization glues black people to, a, to an idea of a shameful past of domination or primitivism. Think of this as, you know, um, um, sort of black people constantly have to prove, no, I really am smart. No, I really am capable of doing X job, Y skill. I'm not like those other Negro, oh, sorry. I forgot I'm in mixed company. I'm not like those other black people you see on the TV. Constantly battling this image that is imposed upon you. But second, Race as a pathology of time, it announces the future as only taking the form of no longer being black or becoming white. What he understands about this is we no longer have an open future in which through practices we are developing what it could mean to live together. Instead, so many of our practices are oriented to, towards how can you get away from the stain of being black, the stain of being thought to come from poverty, the stain of being thought of, uh, of as coming from a culture in which black fathers are absent. And you know, it said it's a matriarchal culture. For those of you who are in the know, I'm talking about things like the Moynihan Report in the United States, but I still have students who say, but isn't there a problem with black fathers? Oh, no. <laughs> ah! Okay. Let me... Let me um, uh, allow me, indulge me two more minutes. But there is a key phrase that Fanon uses in Black Skin, White Mass, and again, I think is outrageously misinterpreted. He talks about in the introduction, you know, that Blacks have access to a zone of non-being that they aren't able to take advantage of to, um, bring, you know, to um, bring about a new start. A lot of people look at this as Fanon saying that Blacks are made into being nothing, what he is actually saying is that you know, the zone of non-being is the capacity of action to transcend its context so that a new foot can be set forward. In other words, he is saying the problem of racialization is it denies the future-oriented capacity of action to reorient the world into what it is not yet. I bring this up because you know, what Fanon is essentially saying is that, and I think you know, critical theory should do this, is you know, one, analyze how race has sedimented the present and has prevented us from actually engaging in a type of utopian creative action that will allow us to undo, uh, he actually uses the French word dépouillement, which is like you know, the shedding of, of a snakeskin that allows us to shed how the past has you know, um, um, racialized us, has you know, encased us. But you know, what I, I will end with is here. Um, there are two things I wanna end with. One, the reason why it's polemical is because I actually think when we're dealing with race as a sedimentation of time, that there really is a problem of how to uh, synchronize theory and practice. That you know, our critical theory, if it is meant to be um, you know, untimely, not meant to be you know, simply integrated into the present, that means, I think, that our critical theory isn't going to necessarily be able to immediately recommend what practices we need to do. At least what it can do is you know, reveal and show the sedimented and fragmented nature of our, of our um, um, historical moment. I say that because I think some people want an easy relationship between the words we write in critical theory and the words you use when you're trying to organize people that be a part of some movement. If you, and I'm sorry to sound Dorian here, if you simply let go of a type of independence for critical theory, then you might actually miss the real um, objective blockages that you know, deform and inhibit social action. The last thing I would like to say is, is, is this. 
we are going to need to be comfortable with the idea that, you know, we know that race can change, but we also need a critical theory of what race will come to mean in the context of a warming planet. Who are the people who are most likely to live in areas first hit by drought and ecological collapse? Race need not be the primary explanation for why those people live there, but it is a stumbling block to producing a synchronous, livable future. In other words, if you um, part of what solidarity requires is that we develop habits and expectations that coordinate us to a shared future, we need to understand that people are going to be um, more hard hit by ecological devastation than others. And for even going forward, the migration that will happen because of this, we need to be aware that the discourse, the ideas of race can reemerge in terms of people's um, uh, ideas of self-preservation, keeping others out, et cetera. I'll end with some stats because, you know, I think it's important to understand, you know, we don't need to think about race as ideological ideas. While the unemployment gap between blacks and whites has decreased, the gap between wealth and income has barely moved. Black home ownership is 30%, 30 percentage points behind whites. Life expectancy for blacks has plunged by four years since COVID. Blacks are twice as likely to lack health insurance, twice as likely to die as infants, and a third as, as likely to die before age 70. Notice all the temporal data in there. If you don't think that that objectively fractures the present, I don't know what you are talking about. And I think critical theory should take that seriously, get offline, touch grass, and understand that there are objective contradictions in the present that you can't wish away by simply saying, but no, we just need to be all you know, the proletarian, the working class, let's do, just do Medicare for all. Of course, do that. But these are real stumbling blocks to social action. Thank you. Now I'm no longer polemical, I'm the moderator again. Um, okay, so the way I'd like to do this is basically um, maybe I'll ask the three of you um, a single question where you could elaborate on what you, you talked about, and then we can open up for, for Q&A. Uh, so my, oh, hmm, yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm going first. I mean, you said you're going to ask me. Oh, okay. I, I see. see. Okay, I'm fair enough. Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, so... Nathan, I really liked what you were talking about. You know, uh, we have to notice that you know, in these increasing authoritarian times, you should not be surprised at you know, the, the language of, uh, of patriarchy and you know, um, gender normalization. I was wondering if you could elaborate on why it's important to think these two things together. One might think, no, the way to, and here I'll play devil's advocate, no, the way to resist authoritarian struggles is simply to build popular power. Why do we need you know, this you know, other theory of patriarchy that can risk confusing us or making it seem like men are bad and thus you know, fracturing your know, bonds of solidarity? Why do you think it's important to think through um, you know, the relationship between patriarchy and authoritarian tendencies? Okay, thank you. This gives me an opportunity to say a couple of things. Um, and one of them is that there's a long section of um, the authoritarian personality written by um, Els Franco Brunswick. And it's the section on like sex and gender. Um, a lot of the questions that were asked of people, much of the F scale, the scale that they developed to measure the degree of um, fascism in your personality. So the title was actually changed when it was moved into English. They started using the word authoritarianism. They had not before, um, which is why it's the F scale, but it's a book on the authoritarian personality, which is, seemed always strange. Um, but a good portion of the way that they measured someone's fascism internally had to do with the implementation of traditional norms, rules, and laws for sex, gender, and kinds of sexuality. So one of the questions explicitly, um, I, I think there are actually two questions explicitly about what should happen to homosexuals, whether you think that homosexuals should be allowed to live in society, or do you think that they should be punished and removed from society? Um, and like 
it's not hard to look around today and see people literally saying, no, we have to get rid of gay people. We cannot allow all of you to intermix with the rest of us. You're literally degenerating society, right? And so you get this kind of um, protection. Um, Hofstetter calls it manning the barricades of civilization from uh, this kind of internal external threat of queerness which is one part of it. And the other thing that I want to elaborate on is the fact that like, now I'm going to be political. Oh, that's what this panel's about. <laughs> like so much feminist theory today is about misogyny and sexism. And actually that is what leads us into thinking men as a class are bad. And therefore, each individual man, as a member of the class, right? We're going to do a nice little fallacy of decomposition. I'm a continental philosopher. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't get to say that to me. Um, but therefore, like individual men are bad, right? And so it's actually a bad thing to be a man, and you should be apologetic for it, and you should make sure you do it as little as you possibly can, right? Not advice I took. But when we think of misogyny and sexism, that actually brings us further away from a critique of an actual social and political and economic structure like patriarchy. The problem when you're thinking about a critique of patriarchy isn't men. The problem is patriarchs. <laughs> and those are different things. And you know what? You can be a patriarch and be a woman. Like, <laughs> tons of women are like, oh yeah, we all know those women, right? And so when we, when we focus on this idea that there's something defective about men that creates like a natural urge to dominate or something like this, we are actually confusing the problem and getting off of the thing that really does connect it to authoritarianism, which is like, who is a patriarch? Well, the patriarch is the father. And it's like, well, who's the father? And it's like, oh, the father is the authoritarian leader. And so it's like, we get a much more natural way of seeing how fascism necessitates a certain gender and sexual order from thinking about patriarchy. Nice, thank you. Um, so my next question is for Eduardo. Eduardo, you talked about what you found promising after you talked about what is not working uh, in the Frankfurt School, but you found promising, you know, their, you know, that fact that they were early pioneers in prisons and penality. I was wondering if you could, you know, elaborate on why it is important to have a critical theorization of penality, say, in the United States, you know, um, how it relates to racialization, economics, uh, et cetera. So what is it that the Frankfurt School allows us to understand about penality, maybe social pathology, path pathologization, uh, et cetera? Right. Um, so... Uh, they, the early Frankfurt School talked about punishment and the social order. Um, and they engaged in a genealogy of different capitalist formations and how they impact the way we punish. Now, the term penality was, as far as I know, was uh, used creatively by Angela Davis. As a matter of fact, we could taught a seminar at the Stony Brook when, when I used to be there, and she, the seminar was called Critical Penology, meaning that uh, the way we penalize, we brand someone as a criminal, are contingent. They are uh, mirrors of what's going on in the political economy in the social psyche. So for instance, um, why is, why was pot criminalized and today is not, or at least in not in every state. So we can talk about regimes of penality. 
uh, which are correlated with certain transformations of the political economy and the social imaginary. Um, so that's what I had in mind. And, and I said, you know, today we have excellent work on this, obviously Angela Davis, but Michelle Alexander. And now there's a, a whole young group of people looking at the ways that African-Americans, Latino men are penalized. And certain things that they do are criminalized. We already have a whole historical layering of this with the black laws. Uh, right after the reconstruction, uh, Southern states began to pass a whole set of laws that uh, essentially led to uh, the prison legal system and an attempt to roll back their rights. So that's, that's what I have in mind. By the way, um, thank you for that question. I failed to mention something um, in my remarks that there are two great women uh, that are part of the Franco School. Um, obviously, Gretel Adorno, totally neglected. She actually used to transcribe the notes of the conversations between Hochheimer and Adorno. She's the one that made sure that the manuscripts of the aesthetic theory were published. And she had a fairly sophisticated and expansive set of dialogues with, with Adorno. I, ha I have no idea if their correspondence has been translated. So, no, Adorno. Oh, Oh, well, there. Uh, that, okay, that has been published. And the other person is Ute Habermas, the, the wife of Habermas, who has a very intense intellectual relationship with Habermas. I know for a fact that she reads everything and approves or disapproves. <laughs> and essentially gives the green light or says, uh -uh, no. So, that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, Paul, I'd like to ask you uh, about the tradition of the oppressed. I really liked how you know you were saying. So here's why you know this concept might be you know really productive and interesting. But here are potential you know drawbacks. So I was wondering if I could ask you to uh, expand a little more and basically. Do we need to jettison the concept of the tradition of the oppressed? We can have these possible pitfalls of, you know, um, solidarities based on, you know, a shared minimal characteristic and difference, this possible romanticization of oppression. You know, how would a Benjaminian response, you know, um, uh, look at that question? I don't know. Fair enough. Yeah, so I gave you an but, easy question. But that but, never okay. stopped anyone in our profession from speaking, so. <laughs> I'll say you became a, couple a true of things. philosopher today. Yes. yes. Here we go. Well, it's hard to understand what he meant, but in some sense, he um, meant what you mean by uh, disarticulating past, present, and future in a particular way. And he thinks in these theses and elsewhere, he's busy writing about what histori how historians block our way, even by imagining history as a continuum. A teacher of mine once said, I, I'm not sure exactly when Benjamin discovered the discontinuum, the historical discontinuum. But he first thought of it as um, a way to do research or something that researchers discovered how strange the past is compared to the present. And then he discovered it as a power where you could um, effect a radical break in which when you didn't imagine the future as continuous, or as he says in these theses, when you don't take the present as an übergang, as a transition. He was in conversations with Bloch. Bloch famously gave him a kind of a upset stomach. <laughs> I don't... He's not the only one. <laughs> yeah. Well, having just recently taught The Principle of Hope, much of it, a very long book, also in prison to a bunch of guys who had been in there for a long time. It's a powerful, powerful set of thoughts. It really blew their minds. And I think Benjamin owes a lot more to Bloch than, um, than he likes to, to say. So one way is to imagine a, a different shape of time. I think that's 
that's the basic task um, to bring about what he calls the real state of exception to combat, he wants to combat oppression per se. And I think we have, we have some beautiful versions of looking at the past as um, discontinuous today. I'm thinking of Saidiya Hartman's fabulational history. I'm thinking of my colleagues, Elizabeth Hinton, who calls um, riots uprisings and discovers a whole set of political practices there that were hidden by the word riot. And my colleague, Ned Blackhawk, whose book is all over the place now, who decided that Native Americans were not just oppressed, but actually contributed in multiple ways to American history. There's a way of working with the archive that produces futures out of a different past that I think is powerful, something that Benjamin's version of a researcher does. Thank you. I think it's interesting to think of Benoff as in the same tradition, in part because he's a psychoanalyst. Um, and so there is a kind of like natural fit of the way of thinking about the subject. Um, and what you're pulling out from what he's doing is this kind of social psychoanalysis, right? Where it's like, no, like we are stuck in a loop of repetition and we keep bringing these past traumas with us into the future. And because of those, we sort of can't break out of them and find new futures, right? Um, traditionally, the way to work through that, psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. um, but you can't put society on the rush. And so what, what would working through that in some way be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sanan has, I, I love this question because then I get to, to show off, you know, I can do chapter and verse. Um, Sanan in chapter four, and again, everyone in Blacks and White Mass, they know chapter five by heart, the lived experience chapter. Partially because I think, you know, polemical again, partially because I think it is nice to fetishize the idea of there being a unitary Black experience. And it's like, Sanan is whispering to me, and now I know what it's like to be Black. One. Um, I'm not actually sure you should read chapter five as Fanon talking about his own lived experience. It's a very narrative chapter. And even in the introduction, he describes it as in chapter five, we're going to see the black consciousness going through this. And so I actually think Fanon's making an aesthetic argument. He's trying to provoke a type of sensibility rather than you know, presenting some autobiography so you know what it's like to be black. But it's chapter four where you start to get what Fanon's answer of what working through is. And he talks about, you know, um, you know, because Fanon was also a, um, a, a psychiatrist. He was trained as a psychiatrist. And he talks about, you know, having patients who um, have lived through colonial terror. And, you know, you can see him responding to Freud. And he's like, when my black patient in, you know, I'm, I'm forgetting the particular Af African country, it might have been Guinea or something like that. My black patient, you know, dreams of an of a M40 rifle being pointed at them. That's not the phallus. That is an actual M40 rifle. And he goes, you know, what, when I'm trying to heal my patient, what I'm trying to do is to make them action, to show them that the change that needs to happen is not in themselves, but changing the social structure under which they live. So Fanon doesn't tell us exactly what that looks like. I think partially, again, with my understanding of the zone of non-being, he can't tell you what the action must look like. What he wants to do is open the way for you know, um, uh, individuals or society to realize that their actions are conditioned by their social historical circumstances, but those social historical circumstances are not you know, um, the law of God. They are the, the, the sedimentation, the congealing of past social historical actions. If that follows, then one social, you know, um, action can produce another layer of social life. And so for him, working through is getting people to no longer, and this is actually my really controversial thing, to stop being so introspective and realizing you cannot heal the wounds of your psychic self if you don't feel that you can take responsibility for your world, to change your world, to you know, bend your world into a human direction. 
And so it's actually fascinating to me that so much of Fanon has been appropriate to, you know, looking inside and saying, wow, I really am a racist. I didn't realize. Fanon wasn't actually that interested in that. What he was interested in is how um, our economic structures anchor us into these really pathological repetition compulsions. But the, the, the healing balm is not you know, feeling guilty about what the world has made one. The healing balm is being able to take responsibility and carry that world to a new place. And so this experience of what he, he keeps calling being actional, his critique of you know, Black Martinicans is that their first action is really a reaction of trying to prove their humanity to white people, trying to prove that they're not really backwards. I think, rather controversially, you don't have to wait till Wretched of the Earth before Fanon starts talking about the capacity for violence as a way of transforming who one is. And I think the working through is finally no longer being so fused to the past, but being able to take responsibility for our present and the hard work of creating a shared um, livable future. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, um, I'm not quite sure how we're supposed to do the, the Q and A if there's gonna be a, okay. There will be a lineup um, over there. And so I think I'm gonna just follow the model I saw last night and take two to three questions and then we'll see what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Where is the best place to stand? Okay, this is awkward. Oh, I'd like to yeah, look at yeah. look at the speakers. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Mendieta was my MA thesis advisor. It's really good to see you. And I remember you don't you don't remind, yeah look a little different, a little heavier. It's been about a decade. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm so glad to hear blocks spoken up because. That was the class that I took with you and a couple others. Um, but I, my question is for you, Rebecca. So, you know, white women voted for Trump twice oh, in no, overwhelming I, I, numbers. Oh, I'm so sorry. Does that not your name? No, Nathan, oh, I'm so sorry, excuse me. Um, so white women voted for Trump in overwhelming numbers twice. And so I'm just thinking about your relationship to the analysis of authoritarian power in the context of you know, race, so sex and gender are racialized. What might we do to think a bit more about the current context of patriarchy and patriarchs as it refers to our upcoming 2024 election? Like what's what should we do, but also where is the analysis of race in your understanding of sex and gender? Thank you. I, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I'm gonna do what we did last night and we'll take um, the three questions and then you respond to all of them? Okay, thanks. Um, I just wanted to make an, uh, uh, an objection that I think was implicit in a number of the discussions, explicit, and maybe something will be gotten out of people directly responding to it. So one kind of worry people have about Frankfurt School, doing specifically Frankfurt School critical theory from below, right, is this worry about the distortions imposed by the kind of universalizing rationalistic modes of analysis um, to quote unquote marginal struggles or diverse struggles or however you want to think about them, right? And like, you can think about this at the level of the theory of history. It's like, even if your theory of history is like funky and Benjaminian and Adornian and whatever, and like bells and whistles, it's still a kind of holistic theory of history and thus distorting. You can think about it even in moral terms. Yes, you're thinking about emancipation, but you know, the, the notion of emancipation is kind of imposed from the point of view of the dialectical theorist and thus distorting, or just even, you know, you could frame this objection in terms of social theory, that you're committed to a kind of holistic, like even if not Hegelian kind of dialectical, you know, neighboring dialectics in a way that like, just in a sociological sense, distorts the subject matter you care about, right? Okay, very well rehearsed objections, but like the upshot's supposed to be like, we can't really do critical theory from below. We can take these like vague analogies of like, oh, it's good to talk about structure. It's good to talk about consciousness, but fundamentally we can't really take the Frankfurt program and apply it to these kinds of points of view. Yeah. 
So I'd like to ask, what if you suspend the idea that saying critical theory should do this, critical theory gives us that, Frankfurt means this. What if you at least pretend that that's too much reification, too much globbed in there, and fish out, this is part of what I'm listening for and thinking about in this symposium, what are the strains, the modes, the styles of inquiry and thinking and reflection that you're trying to dial into. I think one thing that would do is make it easier to see when a line of research or reflection not necessarily traceable to the Frankfurt School per se, whichever generation you mean, might dial into what you're talking about, might actually open up more. Um, for example, Will, I'm very intrigued by you using Fanon to get at uh, racialization of environmental pasts and futures. W.E.B. Du Bois, in his 1925 essay in Foreign Affairs, Worlds of Color, in the last couple of pages, really unleashes what 75 and 100 years later, Ecological Economics Journal would start to pick at as uneven and combined development with racialized patterns passed into the future. Du Bois doesn't belong on that banner behind you, the Frankfurt School, but is that part of what you're getting at? I would think that the perspectivalism and maybe a bunch of other attributes of Du Bois, especially as he's coming to be seen now, does resonate, but how would you, rather than saying critical theory should, blah, 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 what is it that you would point to that makes that work? And then Eduardo, um, the Russian Kirchheimer 1939 punishment in society, yeah, technically that's Frankfurt School because Otto Kirschheimer studied at Frankfurt, but with Schmidt, Horkheimer really didn't like Kirschheimer, barely gave him a room at the table. Rusch was also sort of considered a rascal off to the side. And indeed the analysis there uh, arguably is not very critical theoretical. Um, Dario from forgetting Mimosa years and and his introduction to the 2003 reprint of that Russian Kirschheimer says, you know, this is really labor economics. It's more like social democratic rather than critical theory or something like that. Um, and recent scholarship in political economy of punishment lines right up with that. There's a 2021 Oxford volume on that. Political scientists looking at state structures, racialization, looking around the world. And indeed, um, Adonar Usmani and his co-authors, they go after Michelle Alexander, they go after Angela Davis, using Russian Kirschheimer to draw up from a more logical, empiricistic, materialistic kind of register patterns of state structures. And yeah, they're struggling to figure out just how racialization does and doesn't play in there. Uh, Will, your podcast in January, used one of Adonar's papers with Chris Lewis and uh, David Garland, who's very much in that political economy of punishment. So, but what is it about that that for you, Eduardo, makes that belong here in the symposium on critical theory if we set aside just the sort of invocation of critical theory? Thank you. All right. Um, so I think we have a lot to work with though, with those three questions. So let's try to work those three questions. I see there's one more person in the queue and then we'll go to that person's question and I think that'll take us the time. All right. Um, who wants to start? Okay. Answer the question of the room. Yeah. So, um, race is certainly a part of a Frankfurt School analysis. Um, in the Dialectic of Enlightenment, in the chapter um, The Limits of Enlightenment on anti feminism, they talk not just about anti feminism but they talk about and they talk about uh, black Americans. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> now, um, and so they do see this as part of the same system and it involves very similar questions. The fact that people are racialized and that plays a role in how they relate themselves to power. So they also in that chapter talk more than in any of the others about rackets, 
right? So last night, um, AJ was talking about how the theory of racketeering got taken out of the dialectic of enlightenment because Horkheimer got so state capitalism pilled. Um, and, and I actually disagree. I don't think he was state capitalism pilled. I think he thought everyone else was. And so he was like, you know, this is what you all want to hear. And I'm not going to come out here and like disagree with all of you. I want you to see the things that matter. Um, but that chapter specifically has a lot about rackets and factions and leagues because the relationship between the anti-Semite and the Jew is one of paranoia and conspiracy. And so one of the things that happens here is we can think about white women as acting in this kind of racketeering type of way, right? Um, because they are protected by white men, right? And so they get to pledge a, like power to a white supremacist masculinist structure in hopes that they will be the most protected by it, right? And so rather than seeing themselves as dominated by the system, they see themselves as benefited by it incorrectly. And when they do that, they miss the fact that um, they should be in solidarity with Black people, with immigrants, right? With these specific groups that someone like Trump like directly targets. Um, and it, it has to do with the fact that, right, they see themselves as the proper object of protection, this kind of like innocent whiteness um, of white men, while others, black women, um, uh, immigrant women, et cetera, are not the proper object of white men's protection, right? And I, I won't say more, but I hope that answers. I'll just say two quick things in response to the attacks on the Frankfurt School. Have at it. But um, it seems to me the best thing I always think about the Frankfurt School was the method or non-method, which is to take a question that was relevant to late capitalism or middle cap, whatever you want to call it, and to go at it from a whole bunch of different directions, including empirical directions, to have a musicologist study the way culture is shaping things to not be afraid of psychoanalysis. This is a brilliant undertaking that I don't think anyone else has ever done. And the second side of that to the, the second question about um, universalist claims in theory, it doesn't seem to me like there are universalist claims. There's a lot of critiques of universalism, but there are general claims made about capitalism and its global spread and the universe, whatever hint of universalism in the theory, in Benjamin or Adorno or, or any of these folks, is totally um, vindicated by the uses of critical theory in all sorts of parts of the world. I work with a group in Chile who does amazing things and recognized how the dictatorship was actually working through Benjamin's critique of violence. You've never seen so much work on one text that makes it seem like a text that Benjamin never wrote. So the, the beauty of this is that it moves around and gets reinterpreted, it seems to me. Yeah, and um, I think I'll try to answer a bit of the, the third question. You know, actually, you know, you're, you're probably not supposed to tell people this, but there was a, another title of the book that I'm working on and it had, you know, the, the phrase black critical theory in there. And, you know, then you know, people are asking, you know, what makes it black? What makes it critical theory? But I think secretly on the inside, I do believe something like black critical theory makes sense. And so when I'm talking through these things, you know, basically... I'm okay being a bit an apostate. I don't feel any sense of needing to link up with the genealogy of you know, Adorno and Horkheimer insofar as they are useful and they present either a set of historical arguments or a set of strategies. I will point to them insofar as I'm in the ivory tower and I need to get people to listen to me. I'll be like, oh yeah, you know, but, you know, Fanon and Joe you know, Horkheimer feels like they can kind of say the same thing, but then you'll notice I just start talking about Fanon. But, you know, um, you know, that's the the real Trojan horse. So this idea of, like, Black people in portraying the Academy, you got me. Um, but 
uh, you know, yesterday, as Aaron so lightly pushed me on, you know, said, you know, when I, I was actually making more of a statement than asking a question, um, I do have an understanding of critical theory as, you know, it is a mode of thinking that is and should be untimely with its present. And for me, that means that there isn't any sort of general method, there isn't definitely not some sort of, you know, slavish affiliation or dependence on others who call themselves critical theorists. It's always going to have to be attuned to what I think of as the fragmentation of one's moment and should not be easily assimilable to it. And so Du Bois, the reason why I think he's a Black critical theorist is Du Bois in many ways was very untimely. You know, he was, you know, he was very concerned with, you know, not simply repeating the doxes of the moment. Insofar as he did, then, you know, he kind of let go of the rope. But, you know, I look at, you know, thinkers who aren't simply, in, you know, um, uh, able to be integrated into the moment that they were reflecting upon. And so that's why I kind of began and then elaborate on, well, what does a, you know, critical theory race look like now that almost everybody talks about race? Everyone can, you know, list off, you know, ta Coates, the case of reparations. Everyone can list off, I have a dream. But now they know you're not supposed to only talk about MLK's I have a dream speech. You have to also talk about, you know, um, how he was killed when um, um, the garbage men were striking and all of that. So what do you do now that it's become so obvious to talk about that there are just these reflexes of what one should say? And I think that does put, you know, critical theory and race in a very difficult spot because part of critical theory is trying to raise the consciousness what is hidden but now it doesn't seem like there's anything hidden about race but my claim is it's obviousness is actually hiding you know the thing that we should be trying to raise for our consciousness yeah. excellent um let me address the the question about universalism uh so there are different terms that uh critical theories use to refer to what they they're using so we know negative dialectics uh which is also a situated dialectic, and they also use the, the concept of constellation. And, and so it's there, uh, it's, it's what uh, Judith Butler calls an incomplete uh, universalism. It's a construction of the universal that is uh, always asymptotic, meaning how do we open up to the questions of different experiences, different situated analysis. Now, we have a problem insofar as the Frankfurt School is a school based in the Institute for Social Research that has, that maintain a group of scholars over a diaspora and then return with a very specific mission to re-educate the German youth. And that's very important. Second, the critical theory is what uh, sometimes is called Western Marxism um, or left Hegelianism. And what is related to that is the notion of immanent critique. And immanent critique is always situated. It's based on why are we having this discussion? Um, the early Frankfurt School took very seriously Karl Kosek's I'm sorry, Karl Korsch's uh, analysis of Marxism. If Marxism is a form of historical reflection, it also has to reflect on its own historical determinacy. So, and, of, and so you might argue that critical theory is a method, it's a tradition, it's obviously a school, um, and, and it's a form of social analysis. Um, the interdisciplinary of the interdisciplinary character of the early uh, Frankfurt School, you could say is a proto origin of what today we call intersectionality. Um, and I think that that's really interesting. Um, with respect to uh, Georg Rush and Otto Kischheimer, that's I think that's part of the early Frankfurt School when they, they were really interested in the analysis of labor politics. And, and so that's why that book has that very material um, analysis of the political uh, dynamics of punishment given certain economic regimes. 
And I think that that's still relevant. Now, Otto Kishimer then uh, deviated and he went on to write about political philosophy, which is extremely important. Political justice is a very powerful book. And you can see that he is interested in uh, a historical analysis that is materially grounded on the, the forces, the material forces of production, and then the social relations that it inst they instigate. So that's why um, I know that uh, uh, subsequently, Kishimer's work, as Neumann's work, became very important for the second generation uh, and for the third. Um, so that's what I would say. Thank you for the questions. Okay. Yes, I'll be very quick. Uh, so I want to say something about two of the questions. And one of them was like this epistemological question about like the distorting effect of the theorist. Uh, this is just the like the problem of ideology. <laughs> um, like the basic epistemological problem that Horkheimer talks about all the time is like, who am I to be doing critical theory? <laughs> Why do I think that I can take up this epistemological authoritative position such that I can do what critical theory does, which I like to think of as just this, the clarification of the struggles and wishes of our era, right? Why is it that the theorist thinks that they are in this position? Um, well, why is it that anyone thinks they're in that position? And the answer is no one is better situated to do that than anyone else. We all swim in the pool of ideology and we're all lacking in the right kind of authorization for being the agent who can actually execute a critical theory. Um, so I, maybe it's impossible, but it's impossible for all of us equally. Um, please. Yeah, real quick. Um, this is like a very concrete, like a uh, practical question, which is, so a lot of the stuff you're saying makes sense. You know, the truth is on the side of the oppressed, you know, prisons are terrible and, you know, you know, we have to have better civil rights. And I mean, I think the average person on the streets of America would agree with you. Like most people know that the system is fucked up, you know, like it's, there's an, an inequalities everywhere, you know, um, the Democrats, Republicans are all corrupt. I mean, there's a lot of skepticism out there. No one's like totally swallowing the Kool-Aid. So, and your, so your institute is great. You know, it's fantastic. There's a lot of good stuff there. But so what, cite some examples of how this theory, these theories have been absorbed by the public policy arena, you know, in governments all around the world, you know, with civil rights, with gay rights, with, with workers' rights. I mean, there are examples where progress has been made. Like you cited them yourselves. I mean, I grew up in the 70s, so we have made progress. So that's all. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, let's begin with the, fa the, the following observation. Uh, Neumann, uh, Kishimer, and Marcuse worked for the US government during the war, and they produced very substantive uh, reports on how to deal with the Nazis at the level of culture. That's one effect. Once they did return to Germany, they are completely engaged in the uh, a democratic education of the new youth. And they begin a set of reforms. And we think that there are a bunch of uh, armchair intellectuals but they were very engaged in German politics. That's another example. Habermas was a frequent guest at the Reichstag, making recommendations. There were very intense debates, for instance, the historian's debate. Um, he writes a very important book on law and democracy, meant to make interventions, uh, and so on. So, there are practical dimensions and lessons, and, and they did have impact. Yeah. And here's a more recent one in Chile at the UMSE, which is the teacher's college. 
In the philosophy department, they teach only critical theory, and they teach all the high school teachers of philosophy for the country, and they recently had a revolution. And they soon will have a new constitution. We hope it, it's better than the last version. All right, um, I think that does it for us. Thank you all for coming to our panel. Hope you enjoyed it. And